good afternoon, Skip said. Hang on, slow down. Slow down a bit. Yes, Mrs. Brakeford, around the corner. You've seen what? A fire scene. You can't have done. They're supposed to be extinct in Australia and Tasmania. People still see you from there, but this is bullshit. You see, tell me, tell me, tell me again. You've seen a dog-like creature with stripes. Well, there aren't any dog breeds as far as I know with stripes. I wonder what... Are you sure? Well, it does sound horribly like a fire scene to me. Your description does sound very spot on. Okay, I think we're going to have to come out and investigate. Stay where you are. Yes, my name's John Downs and this is Archie the Bumblebee and welcome to another episode of On the Track. Hey Charlotte, come and see this. This is something really weird I've just been sent. Each day I get sent stuff from all over the world. And this morning, as I was preparing for Charlotte to arrive to do some filming, I received this. It's a story from the Ashborough Courier Tribune in North Carolina. The story reads, The lakes of Gaston County, North Carolina have been invaded by a fluorescent-looking mutant creature, if you believe video that appeared last week on YouTube. It was posted by a conspiracy theorist channel known for hosting videos of alleged aliens, Bigfoots and sky serpents. The YouTube channel Disclosed Screen says that it was filmed on April the 10th in the three and a half acre Gaston County Lake by somebody known as Paula Terrell, who is asking for help in identifying the fish. It's something they've never seen before, says a voiceover in the video. Other media outlets have since picked up on the video, including the Daily Star of the United Kingdom and LiveTechInfo.com, all of which are questioning what the creature might be if it isn't a fish. Bizarre four-foot mutant creature spotted in North Carolina Lake leaves witnesses baffled, says the headline in the Daily Star. Commentators on the internet have guessed that it could be anything from a type of koi to a remote-controlled toy submarine with fake skin wrapped around it. One person even suggested it was a dead peacock. It kind of, it kind of looks sort of mechanical in the way it's moving. It, I mean, it does, it does reminisce sort of like a sort of silicone texture to me. Honestly, I have no idea what it is. But it does look sort of a silicone mechanical thing, but. It's the tail that looks like a feather, mm. which I think's odd. I, I, have, I don't know what the hell it is either. Mm. And it arrived in my email inbox this morning. Charlotte and I agree on one thing. Neither of us have any idea what it is. And so I asked her what we should do next. And she, with wisdom far beyond her years, suggested that we leave it up in the air and wait and see if any new evidence emerges. But in the meantime, what do you think it is? Email me with your ideas and we'll put it in next month's episode. And whilst we're on the subject of inexplicable stories from around the world, check this one out, you funks old brothers. This story appears to have come from Santa Fe in Argentina, and it's an image which is circulating on the internet of a dog-like creature which was allegedly spotted in Argentina after having killed two large dogs. 
The lanky creature is definitely not human, well, duh, and it's definitely not like any canid we've seen. This is what they say, and I agree, it's not like any canid I've seen either. But they ask, what exactly should it be? And by the way, when I'm talking about the they, the they in question are outofplaces.com. According to reports, the thing was captured on camera in Santa Fe and locals said it looked like a camel with a long neck and a small head and that it was responsible for the death of a German shepherd and a pit bull. The creature disappeared shortly after the blurry image was captured and it's opened the floodgates for speculation and scepticism on social media. Several people online have suggested that the image is merely a photoshopped photograph of a werewolf from Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. So, what do you think, Charlotte? It does look like a long-legged sheep with no hair. <laughs> Not something out of one of the Harry Potter movies? Kind of does look like Professor Lupin, but... So there you have it. It's either actor David Thewlis hanging out mysteriously in the back streets of an Argentinian town or it's a long-legged hairless sheep. This is science in action and cryptozoology doesn't get any more cutting edge than this. Charlotte quite rightly suggested that before we make any decisions on the subject we ought to wait and see if anything else transpired. And believe it or not, within a few hours of her saying this, we found out the truth behind it. And yes, Charlotte was right all along. It was a picture from the Harry Potter movie. Or sort of, anyway. There's jolly nice and very useful people at Snopes.com announced the truth a few hours after we had edited the previous pictures together. The pictured creature is not terrorising a neighbourhood in Argentina, they tell us, nor did it slaughter any pet dogs. Why? Because this demon is fictional, existing only within the fantasy universe of the Harry Potter books. This image was created by manipulating a piece of concept art for Remus Lupin, a professor afflicted by lycanthropy as depicted in the work Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. The image is available via the Pottermore website, which also offers more backstory about the werewolf professor. Here's a comparison of the Harry Potter concept art and the mysterious creature supposing we roaming Argentina with the concept art flipped for a better comparison. Yup, those people at Photoshop have done it again. And those people at Snopes.com have once again come up with the truth. And Charlotte, I apologise, my dear, you were completely and utterly right all along. <laughs> I knew it. No, you didn't. You said it was a long-legged, hairless sheep. <laughs> young people today. It feels strange making this month's episode, as Graham is in Arizona. He is usually a very big part of the filming and editing process. This is his second trip. He went there in February last year, and while he's on holiday and not looking for mystery animals, there is lots of things of cryptozoological interest in Arizona. Richard Freeman loves jungle. But Graham and I have always been very fond of deserts, ever since the two of us went to the Puebla Desert in the middle of Mexico just over 20 years ago. But there are other things about America which impress Graham as well. Egg McMuffin and coffee to go. That's very good. Although deserts may appear at first to be harsh and unforgiving places, they are actually unique ecosystems and homes for all sorts of animals, known and unknown. So, Carl, if he's lucky, what should Graham be keeping an eye out for while he's travelling around the back roads of Arizona? OK, we have the, uh, the M.A. Pathenia, which is... Uh type of little people reported from southwestern Arizona. Uh, two foot tall, um, considered to be shapeshifters, so they've obviously got a, uh, a supernatural uh, element to them. Uh, we have the Arizona Jaguar, which was covered a couple of episodes ago. Um, Panthera onca arizonensis, which is a subspecies of jaguar of uncertain status. Almost hunted to extinction by 1905, although breeding populations persisted at least and through the 1940s and probably up until the 1960s. 
Uh, we also have the Arizona Chupacabra, which is uh, a spiny back sanguivore reported from eastern Arizona. Uh, the Arizona Chupacabra is a spiny backed version, very similar to the, uh, the, the reports from Puerto Rico. Um, it doesn't appear to be a blue dog type, it appears to be a true Chupacabra. And finally, we have Loomis's Pichu Kawati, which is a small horned venomous snake, grey above, rosy below, reported from Arizona. This would quite likely be a pit viper. And at the risk of being accused of vulgar levels of self-publicity as far as CSZ books are concerned, these and many more mystery animals from around the world are described in George Averhart's Mammoth, two-volume Encyclopedia of Cryptozoology, available from CFZ Press. Although I joke that my wife doesn't understand me, in fact the truth is, sadly for me, that she understands me only too well. And we actually agree on most things, except earwigs. The order Demetra, which means skin wings, or earwigs, contains about 2,000 species. And they're fascinating little creatures, mostly nocturnal and feeding on a wide variety of plants and animals. And no, they don't go into people's ears. The fossil record of these insects goes back about 208 million years, and they're found widely across the world in both tropical and temperate places. Now, within the past month or so, Lars Thomas, our old friend and colleague from Denmark, and Linda Thompson have made a momentous discovery because they have proved that everything the people thought they knew about earwigs in Denmark is completely wrong. Up until now, the earwig fauna, or rather the history of the earwig fauna in Denmark, has been relatively straightforward, with only five naturally occurring species. But earlier this year, Lars and Linda discovered a sixth, or did they? Further investigation proves that an Italian entomologist some decades ago discovered that what had originally been known as Chylodurella acanthropygia, the forest earwig in Denmark, is not one but actually three different species. Acanthropygia, Guantheri and Thaleri. Later studies also seem to show that the real forest species, Acanthopigia, which has been known to exist in Denmark since forever, as Lars writes, does in fact have a far more eastern and southern distribution than previously assumed, and that it is probably the Guntheri species which can be found in northern Europe. This has already been proven in Norway and parts of Germany, but until now, nobody has studied the earwig fauna of Denmark in any great depth, until in March, when Lars and Linda found three earwigs which turned out to be Guantheri. So, does that now mean that there are six species of earwig in Denmark, or are there only five Acanthropedia not actually ever having lived there at all? The smart money is on this, but you're just going to have to wait and watch this space if you're an Earwig fan. Well done, Lars. Well done, Linda. And now it's time for a brand new feature for the show. It's time for On The Track Product Placement. There are all sorts of people who are friends and relations of the CFZ and people who are members of the CFZ themselves who do all sorts of peculiar things. And now, each episode, we're going to give a brief roundup of some of these aforementioned things. A couple of months ago, I heard about an interesting art project from Lincolnshire. It's called 200 Fish, and artists from all over the world were asked to contribute their vision of one of the fish species which are found on... I contributed a piece of computer-generated art of the river lamprey, Lampetra fluviatalis. But then I realised a few days ago that I could actually have done more to help, because this is a very important project, raising awareness of what we are doing to our coastlines and to the animals that live there. So I decided to phone up Biff Vernon and ask him more about the project. It's in August we're having 
an exhibition called 200 Fish. Um, and that's uh, really a project which has taken off quite spectacularly. Um, we, we found that there were over 200 different species of fish in the North Sea. And uh, yes, that came as a bit of a surprise to some of us who couldn't name more than about a dozen. Um, but uh, apparently there's 201 species that breed and uh, another 16 or so that are occasionally found in the North Sea. So what we've done is we've invited, invited artists to pick one species of fish, do a bit of research on it, produce a work of art based on that fish, could be any medium, um, and, a, and produce a little bit of writing, a description of, of the fish from a sort of scientific point of view, a sort of factual account, and also something a bit more creative, what attracted them to this species of fish, or whether this fish occurs in folklore and song and poetry and, and, and other. so it's up to the individual artist to, to, to do what they like to produce um, a visual work of art and also a little piece of writing which serves as a sort of a rather elaborate label to go with the fish and uh, the, the process is that, that we, we've invited these artists and they, they say please can I do such and such a species and, um, and we tick them off on the list now, when they've done their piece of work, they take a photograph of it and, and send it in to us. And we then put it up on the website. Now, so far, we're up to 150 of them have been completed. So we've got a website that's now got 100, uh, 150 photographs of pieces of art. Um, a lot of them are paintings, but there's sculpture, there's things done in clay and metal and wood and fabric and somebody's crocheting some. So it comes in all sorts of different medium. Um, the majority of the people are from Lincolnshire, but we're, we're not restricting it to that. And we've um, got some from all over, the, all over the world. We've had a, a little wooden sculptured um, ray fish has, has been sent from Kentucky in the United States and I promised another from Germany and one from Hong Kong. So we had a little bit of a wide scatter because when you put something on the internet, you know, all sorts of people can f discover it and, and think, uh, I'd like to get involved in that. And, um, and who'd have thought, you know, there were people all over the world who were interested in uh, the fish of the North Sea. Um, so then what we do is in August, we collect all these fish together and we're going to put them on in an, ex in an exhibition. And the venue for that is going to be a new gallery at Chapel St. Leonard's on the Lincolnshire coast. Um, it's a brand new place. It's, it's still a building site, actually, at the moment. <laughs> um, but it's very nearly finished, and hopefully it'll be completed in time. Um, and it's called the North Sea Observatory. Absolutely fabulous building with one glass wall which looks out across the sea. So, absolutely ideal venue for putting on an exhibition of the fish of the North Sea. Whilst putting this programme together, we are always trying to break new ground. And whilst webcams have been around for something like 20 years now, they're not something we've ever used before. However, almost by chance, our old friend and colleague, Richard Muirhead, recently bought a computer that had a built-in webcam. And this got us thinking this would be a way of being able to involve more people from the world of the CFZ in this show. The picture quality is more jerky than I would have liked, and I don't know if this is down to my computer, Richard's computer, internet lag or something else entirely. But I do think that it provides an interesting new aspect to this show. So, as an experiment, here we're talking to Richard Muirhead about the things that he's currently working on. OK, okay tell, tell me, what, is, what are you researching at the moment? At the moment, I'm putting together Flying Snake 13, uh, Strange Clouds, Monster Toads. Um, I've got a blog paired for cryptozoology online on some strange animals in Minnesota. I found uh, something about a plague of moths in New York, some large green coloured moth. So t tell, tell me, what, what about these animals in Minnesota? Minnesota? What sort of animals are we talking about? 
Well, this is a very old story. Well, this is from the 1950s. Um, the one was uh, sort of like a troggle dyke, ape man, weird, cross between like a monkey and a human, which have died out, almost died out by 1950. There's another one that was it was a white coloured snake that um, only came out when it was snowing or when there was snow on the ground. I asked Richard about his magazine, Flying Snake. Well, I began Flying Snake in 2011, um, and I, I try and bring it out um, about twice a year. This is issue 12. It's it's not the same as Animals and Men. I, I'm more interested in what I call archival cryptozoology, anything like... Well, 1950 is just the date in my head. Issue 13 should be out in about three weeks. I've got stuff on the Bear Lake monster from cryptozoologist called David Weatherly. Um, I've got something up from Ulrich, the German 40 and Ulrich Megan on the weird zoology of Lake Lugano in Italy. I've got something on Spain's first mystery cat back in the early 16th century. I've got something from Macclesfield on Somebody has invented generating electricity using dog poo. <laughs> it's not that's not an April Fool's Day joke. There's really somebody really supposedly is going to use all the dog poo that hangs around on our pavements and turn it into electricity, if you can believe it. <laughs> I've got something on an exploding ostrich egg. A weird, a pelt of a cat in Yukon. That's about. 100 plus years, just a little snippet on a, a sort of mini little cat about two feet long but with a pelt like a tiger in Yukon. Um, and the rest, well I won't spoil it for you, but you rest will have to um, contact me on Facebook or John or at Richard Muirhead Macrosil. So um, the crypto brain is busy as ever. I've known Richard for longer than I've known anybody else in the world that I'm not actually related to. And he's one of the most extraordinary polymaths that I have ever met. He has what Charles Fort would have called an amazing wild talent for dredging up the most obscure and often ludicrously funny items of data which would otherwise have remained completely languishing in obscurity. And I'm very pleased to say that my old friend will be a regular on this show in the future. Watch this space, guys! Okay, and now it's over to Karina for our monthly visit of the Watcher of the Sky. Hollyhocks. I have always felt a curious affinity with this species of bird, probably because for 30 years I was a secretary, and this is a secretary bird a highly specialised ground-dwelling bird of prey from an older family than the other Old World raptors. It is native to sub-Saharan Africa and is sadly non-migratory, so will never be a natural visitor to these shores. But I think you'd be surprised quite how many completely unexpected avian visitors Britain does have. And that's what this segment upon the track is all about. Bernard Hoivermans himself said that cryptozoology wasn't the study of monsters, but the study of unexpected animals, and in the UK, what could be more unexpected than vultures, spoonbills and albatrosses? Yes, even the kings of the Southern Ocean have been seen in British waters. Two species of albatross have been recorded in the UK in recent years. Not all of our feathered visitors are quite so spectacular, but nearly every day there is something exciting to greet the watcher of the skies. Hello everybody from me and Prudence. And it's once more that we are looking at the birds, dear friends, once more. Rare common cranes have returned to the point of levels. The bird died out across the UK 400 years ago, so the return to the Gwent levels has been welcomed. It is thought the cranes spotted come from the Great Crane Project, a reintroduction scheme which released 93 hand-reared cranes between 2010 and 2014 on the RSPB West Sedgemoor Reserve in Somerset. However, once again, local extinction of this once native bird of the Gwent levels could occur, this time due to the proposed new M4 motorway, 
which will run through the Bearcroft Common section of the Magor Marsh Reserve and destroy the very area near to where the cranes have already been seen. Cranes look similar to herons but are much larger and make for a spectacular sight as well as sound. Their deep call can be heard at a distance of more than three miles. Hundreds of bird watchers have come to Britain after an American bitten was spotted for the first time in almost a decade. It was first sighted flying above the reeds in Carlton Marsh, Suffolk, which is also the first time it has been recorded in the county. They can be difficult to spot in the reed beds they inhabit due to their effective camouflage. The American bittern is a species of wading bird from the heron family, which breeds in Canada and the northern and central parts of the United States. There are plans to push forward an exper experimental cull of hundreds of ravens in Scotland. Scottish Natural Heritage, SFH, has granted a group of farmers and gamekeepers a five-year license to kill 300 birds in Perthshire. But RSP, RSPB Scotland has now claimed the scheme has little to do with protecting wading birds, as had been claimed, and is instead a thinly veiled attempt to get rid of a per perceived pest to benefit grouse shooting estates. The charity said the location should have set some alarm bells ringing at SNH due to its appalling track record as a site known for the illegal persecution of raptors. Golden eagles and other protected species have suspiciously vanished in the vicinity and police are currently probing the disappearance of a satellite tank white-tailed eagle nearby. In an online blog, the RSPB requested the license be halted, adding in light of previous loud complaints by estates in this and other grouse shooting areas about raven predation of red grouse, we and many others see this raven research proposal as simply a rather transparent mechanism whereby a perceived pest species can be removed to benefit red grouse with the conservation of raven birds as a byproduct. Conservation charity also poured cold water on claims ravens are to blame for the plummeting population of wading birds such as the curlew, redshank and the lapwing. <coughs> in other news, a breakthrough in the recovery of human DNA could police could police could help police crack wildlife crimes, including the illegal persecution of Scotland's iconic birds of prey. Investigations could be supported by new research into retrieving human DNA found at crime scenes. The research was initiated by the Partnership for Action Against Wildlife Crime, PAW, Scotland, and carried out by the Scottish Police Authorities, SPA, Forensic Services, the Scottish Government and the University of Strathclyde. It found DNA can be traced on traps that have been outside for at least 10 days and from rabbit baits and bird carcasses at crime scenes after at least 24 hours. Until now, efforts to prosecute have been hampered by a lack of evidence. Although, of course, in publicising this breakthrough, the researchers have warned those nasty, beloved little people who take part in these crimes, so no doubt they will become more vigilant in their covert operations. The first black-tailed godwit released into the wild in the fens after being hand reared has returned home from its winter migration, wildlife experts have said. The male, named Delph, is one of the 26 raised at... Why are you giggling, Charlotte? Delph. Delph. As in Delphi, I don't know. So it's too much, it's not crazy, it's stupid, isn't it? I'm the kid, I'm still in it seems she's found a titty's nest and she's laughing at the eggs. The male, named Delph, is one of 26 raised at the Wild Fowl and Weapons Trust, WWT, Wellney Weapons Centre in Cambridgeshire and released into the wild last summer from where they migrated as far as Portugal for the winter. The waving birds were hatched in captivity and hand-reared by wildlife experts from the RSPB and WWT away from dangers 
such as predators, in a process known as herd head starting, which aims to improve survival chances and boost numbers. It wasn't necessarily expected that any of the handy birds would return this summer, so Delta's appearance is a welcome surprise. A belted kingfisher. <laughs> A, belt. a belted kingfisher was sighted on St Mary's in the Isles of Scilly and it's only the fourth time it has been seen in the UK. Ornithologist Will Wagstaff said we've had the wrong wind for it. <laughs> See, I knew you were going to do that. We expect American birds with westerlies, but we've had southerlies and southeasterlies. I'm sure the weathermen say that differently. They would say that, would they? There's something like southwest, southeast, southeast. It is thought that the mild autumn may have seen the bird lingering in Europe before heading north. There's actually a good heading for that story, something about twitches go silly over this bird. The Cornish national bird, Chuff, has crossed the Tamar into Devon. <coughs> Back in 2001, a pair of chuffs suddenly and mysteriously appeared in the lizard after a 54-year absence, and DNA testing has now discovered that those first birds probably came from Southern Ireland. The population in Cornwall, are we keeping them up here? <laughs> the population in Cornwall has slowly increased, and there are believed to be around 15 breeding pairs of this rare bird. However, the reason the appearance of chuffs on the North Devon coast is being regarded as such good news is that it takes the Cornish colony a big step closer to Wales, which is where far larger groups of chuffs exist along the sea coasts. Claire Mucklow from the RSPB said, having chuffs resident again in North Devon will help bridge the gap between the populations in South Wales and Cornwall and help the chuffs to thrive. As well as being included in Cornwall's coat of arms, it also appears regularly in Cornish legend, and it is said that King Arthur was transformed into a child when he died, the red feet and beak representing his violent, bloody end. Its demise in England was brought about by habitat destruction and its persecution as an agricultural pest. They used to be common in the West Country to the extent that the bird was once known as the Crow of Cornwall. In the bid to encourage the chuffs to resettle permanently in North Devon, where the last breeding pair was seen just over a hundred years ago, the National Trust, RSPB and North Devon Coast Areas of Outstanding Natural Beauty have teamed up to introduce a unique type of nesting box in several places. But as the chuffs are a Schedule 1 species, the exact locations of the nest boxes cannot be revealed. I do have to add here, however, that chuffs were seen a few years ago in Hartman and Valley by Lars Thomas, a long-standing consultant of CFZ. And now it's time to go over to Jonathan for this episode's look at new and rediscovered species. And so from Prudence, and from me, and Shara, it is goodbye from the bird section. The genus Rhinogobius is widely distributed in fresh waters along the western Pacific coast of tropical and temperate Asia. A new species, Rhinogobius maximilivertus, has been described from Anhui province in eastern China. This species can be differentiated from all congeners by a combination of the following characters. Up to six longitudinal brown to black stripes along the side of the body Pectoral fin rays modally 14, pre-dorsal scale series 5 to 9, lateral scale series 28 to 30, transverse scale series 6 to 7, brangostagal membrane with about 30 red round spots in males, and two black oblique stripes parallel along the upper jaw and the anterior portion of the cheek. Analyzing sequences of cytochrome C oxidase subunit the new species has been revealed to be closely related to, but distinct from Rhinogobius wulanginensis. 
A new species of cutthroat eel, Dysoma alticorpus, is described based on a single specimen collected in a trammel net at a depth of 350 metres off the coast of Eilat, Israel. The new species belongs to the Dysoma anguillaria species complex, which comprises species possessing a well-developed pectoral fin, intermaxillary teeth, a unicereal row of 7 to 15 large compound teeth in the lower jaw, which may be followed by a smooth few smaller teeth, and an anteriorly situated anus with the trunk shorter than the head length. Based on recent discoveries and an integrative study including external morphology, osteology and molecular genetics, Madagascar endemic chameleons of the Kaluma Botogeri complex within the Kaluma Nasutum species group is under continual revision. Three new species of these small-sized occipital lobed chameleons have been described. Kalumna retzeri is a species from the Serata and Marajeji massifs from northern Madagascar with a spectacular display coloration in males, clearly notched occipital lobes and females with a dorsal crest. Kaluma lefona is described based on a male specimen from Tatsurana in northern Madagascar with widely notched occipital lobes, a long and pointed rostral appendage, a dorsal crest and a frontoparietal fenestra in the skull roof. This last character also occurs in six other columna species and this presence and width are correlated with the elevational distribution of the species. And columna julii is known only from a small isolated forest fragment near Moramanga in East Madagascar and only females have been found so far. It is a relatively large member of the C. nasutum group with a distinct dorsal crest and numerous infralabial scales. Two of the new species are known exclusively from their type localities and protection of the habitats of all three as soon as possible has been recommended. I'm always touched when I read of new species being named after cult TV or movies. Richard Freeman and I have always planned to name our first cetacean after the Tyrian dung whale, a fictional animal referred to in Dances at the End of Time by Michael Moorcock, and it's good to see other people share our frivolous outlook. Roman Ogobio skywalkeri, I don't have to tell you where that name comes from, is a new species described from the Upper Moor River in the Australian Danube drainage. It is related to our Baronesque from the Mediterranean Basin. It is distinguished from that species by lacking epithelial crests on the predorsal back, having 12 to 14 total pectoral ray fins rather than 10 to 11, and usually 8.5 branched dorsal ray fins versus 7.5. It is distinguished from other Roman agobia species in the Danube drainage by having a very slender body a moderately long barbel extending slightly beyond the posterior eye margin and no epithelial crest on the predorsal back. Peltophorini armata is a new species of toad described from the South Paleos land of Hispaniola in the West Indies. This is the only native toad species known to inhabit the Barahona Peninsula in the Dominican Republic in the southernmost part of Hispaniola and it's allopatric with the widely distributed Hispaniolan toad species, P. guantheri. However, in a molecular phylogeny, the closest relative of P. armata is the Puerto Rican species, P. lumia, with rigid shares of protrusive snout, large orbits, a depressed head, indistinct or absent infraorbital crests, and a long and complex advertisement core but differs from it greatly by the very long cephalic crests and in the massive and spinous parotid glands that converge medially on the dorsum. The birds of paradise are a quintessential example of elaborate ornamental diversification amongst animals. Ornamental evolution in the birds of paradise is exemplified by the presence of a highly integrated courtship phenotype which is the whole package of plumage, ornaments, behaviours and sounds that each species uses during courtship. Characterising a species' courtship phenotype is therefore a key part of transmogrification from bird-like form into something abstract and otherworldly. The courtship phenotype of the superb bird of 
paradise, Lumpur Superb, is one of the most remarkable of all. Recent research by Erdestad et al. suggests that the genus Lofroina is not a single species, but is likely a complex of three allopatric species, spanning the entire island of New Guinea. El Nieda in the Bird's Head Peninsula, El Superba throughout the Central Cordillera, and El Minor in the Papuan Peninsula of the East. Of these, Nieda is the most phenotypically divergent, with plumage traits hypothesized to possibly produce differences in ornamental appearances during the display. It has been thought that the genus Lampris currently comprises two species, Lamprix guttatus and Lampus immaculatus, commonly known as Opa and the Southern Opa, respectively. Hyde et al. presented DNA sequence data which revealed the presence of five distinct monophyletic lineages within L. guttatus. More data has recently been presented supporting this, and it appears that there are now five species of Opa. I'm sure there's a stupid pun there, but I can't think of one. Examination of historical and recent collections of small rhinophilus bats reveal cryptic taxonomic diversity within southern African populations previously referred to as R. swinyai and R. landerai. Specimens from Mozambique morphologically referable to R. swinyai were phylogenetically unrelated to R. swinyai from the eastern Kek province of South Africa based on cytochrome B sequences and showed distinctive echolocation, baculum and noseleaf characters. Due to their genetic similarity to a previously reported molecular operational taxonomic unit from northeast eastern South Africa, Zimbabwe and Zambia, it's now recognised that the available synonym R. Rhodesii has been used to denote this distinct evolutionary species. An additionally genetically distinct and diminutive taxon in the Swinyai group, now named Rhinophilus gorgonzi, is described from Gorgoronza National Park in Mozambique, and specimens from Mozambique referable based on morphology to our Landerai were distinct from Topotific Landerai from West Africa based on mitochondrial DNA sequences and acoustic nose-leaf and baculum characteristics. This Mozambique population has been assigned to the available synonym Arlobatus. A new genus of microhylid subfamily Asterophironae frogs has been described from northern and eastern Indochina, containing three new species. Vietnamophrine are secretive miniaturized frogs under 21 mm in length with a mostly semi fossorial lifestyle. Results of phylogenetic analyses assigned the new genus into the mainly Australian subfamily Asterophorine as a tister taxon to the genus Siamophrine from southern Indochina. A new species of Europeltis snake has been described from a series of six type specimens from the Anaikati Hills of the Western Ghats of Tamil Nadu, Peninsula India. Europeltis bupathi is distinguished from congeners by having more than 200 ventral scales, 17 dorsal scale rows at mid-body and by the size and shape of the rostral and frontal shields. Although tens of specimens have been seen in the vicinity of the type locality and previously reported there as U. elioti, the new species is known only from this locality and faces threats from road traffic, habitat loss and climate change and possibly a condition that forms heads and head shields which is at least superficially similar to snake fungal disease reported from wild snakes in North America and Europe. I would like to also point out that whereas every effort has been made to contact the copyright holders of these photographs, we believe that we are justified in reproducing them in this not-for-profit video using the policy of fair use. However, if there is anybody who believes that their intellectual or legal rights have been infringed, please contact us and we will do our best to bring the matter to a mutually acceptable solution. And next month's episode... Graham will be back from Arizona next month, and we hope to hear of his adventures. And then there's this.
Ever since we restarted this show back in the summer, we've been telling you how Louis was going to set up a Patreon campaign. Well, he's done it. And you can come, see what he's done, and hopefully support us in a very real way at this address. Thank you, guys. Thank you for watching this month's episode. If you enjoyed it, make sure to click that like button, and if you want to see more content like this, subscribe and to click the notifications bell so you get notified whenever we upload a new video. If you could share this video on Facebook and Twitter, we will be really grateful, and we hope you see you next time. Goodbye! So, ladies and gentlemen, here we are at the end of another episode, and I hope you've enjoyed it as much as we've enjoyed doing it. And I want to say a special thank you to our guest star, Archie the Bumble who has been absolutely magnificent in his starring role. Archie and I would like to thank everybody who's helped put the show together this time. It has been more than usually complicated with Graham being in America, but he'll be back next episode, hopefully with some fabulous tales for us. Thank you also everybody who's supported the CFZ over the last month, and I want to say a special thank you to Mike Turner for his generosity. And so, that's about it. And until next episode, be seeing you. Ha <laughs> ha, be seeing you. Archie, you don't have to look at me quite so. Oh, now even Archie's disappeared. <laughs>